So in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the work of Karl Marx. And I'm in particular going to highlight how it is that Marx understood the major industrial transformation that I identified in the very first lecture. So um, Marx's approach to understanding the industrialization of society and the fundamental transformation of society from a kind of feudal society into something else. And Marx is part of a group of early sociologists who tried to explain these really rapid changes that they were seeing around them, associated in part with this major population growth but also changes in the economic and political structures of society, um, uh, uh, as well as a related set of changes in the ways in which people related to one another. Um, and it's hard to emphasize just how profound these changes were through uh, the 16, 17, 18, and 1900s um, uh, in, in comparison to other changes that we've seen in society. Um, the, the speed with which today we think about how digital technologies are transforming the ways in which we relate to one another are certainly important, um, you know, but, but I would opine that, you know, some of the things that were happening in the 1800s were so profound in terms of massive, massive numbers of people moving from the country into the city, changing the ways in which they worked, that that change, that first, in, that industrial revolution may in fact have been even more profound than the changes that we're seeing today. So, you know, Adam Smith uh, uh, wrote in 1776, uh, this book, The Wealth of Nations. And um, Smith argued basically that the division of labor uh, allowed for the production of an enormous amount of wealth, increase in wealth. Um, and Smith's argument was basically this. Um, people are good at different things. Um, people have different kinds of skills. And if you exist in a kind of agricultural society where everyone has to do everything, some time is basically wasted. So, you know, let's say I'm really, really good at growing carrots and potatoes, but I'm not very good at um, tending to sheep, um, but because of the structure of our society, I have to both grow carrots and potatoes and tend to sheep. And the sheep give me milk that I can make cheese from, they give me wool that I can make clothes from, and the carrots and potatoes keep me fed, along with maybe occasionally I kill a sheep. You know, that the time I spend with the potatoes and the carrots is really efficient, but the time that I spend with the sheep is not efficient because I'm not particularly good at turning wool into, in, uh, turning the, the wool of the sheep into yarn, which then I can turn into clothing. And I'm not particularly good at raising the sheep. So a more efficient way to organize the society and one where there could be in fact more surplus would be if I focused on potatoes and carrots and maybe somebody else out there focused on sheep and maybe somebody else even further out there focused on knitting. And if we divided tasks up in this way, and there was somebody who's really good at you know, sheep, and there's somebody who's really good at knitting, and then you've got me who's really good at carrots and potatoes, that the consequence of this would be that we would have more of everything. There would be more of everything available to us because I would produce a lot of surplus potatoes and carrots. The sheep person would create a lot of surplus sheep, be that the milk of the sheep or the wool, that the knitting person would produce a lot of surplus um, knitting, uh, clothing, and that we'd all be better off if we specialized. And so Smith begins to be kind of interested in how it is that a division of labor or that people specializing in particular tasks that maybe they're better at may increase the overall wealth of nations. It may increase the wealth of a society because people can focus on the things that they're good at and then use the surplus of what it is that they produce to generate income or money that they can trade with other people who are similarly producing surplus goods. And so for Smith, he became super interested in how it was that actually instead of, you know, being generous or 
focusing on doing lots of things, it may be better to organize a society in such a way that people specialize in tasks in order to generate greater efficiency, in order to create more surplus so that societies could be better off or wealthier. And this concept of a division of labor then runs through a range of uh, ideas about how we organize a society. Each of us should find something we're really good at so we can get paid more to do it or so that we can produce more of that thing. You as students may be thinking like, you know, I've got to pick a major. I have to pick something I'm really good at and, and sort of pursue that thing because if I can find the thing that I'm great at, that's gonna be really beneficial. Um, now, this is like, you shouldn't take Smith or any of the theories that I talk about in, over the course of these lectures as true or false. You should think of them as useful or not useful for understanding different kinds of things. These are concepts to think with. And sometimes the concepts can be very rich and provide you with deep insights into the world around you. And sometimes they're not as useful. Karl Marx um, existed in deep sort of tension with Smith and actually spent a lot of his life arguing against Smith. Um, uh, uh, Marx was a really beautiful writer um, and wrote sometimes in these florid like elaborate, well, not elaborate, these like very evocative sense, sentences. And um, in those sentences, he sometimes says things like the vulgar political economists. And when he uses that phrase, he kind of means that Smith and, and Smith's descendants, the people who think in the way that Smith does. And Marx is going to kind of take on a similar set of phenomenon as Smith, but read it in a very different way. Fundamentally, Marx was a historian and econom economist, um, uh, but kind of gets claimed by sociology as one of the founders of our discipline. There was no sociology when Marx was writing. or If there was, it was kind of very, very preliminary. And Marx was interested in the trajectories of societies. So, you know, not just this moment of the emergence of an industrial society and the associated division of labor, but the long trajectory of societies. And Marx argued that if you looked at this long history of how it was that societies developed, you would come up with two basic conclusions. The first is that the fundamental feature of a society is conflict. Marx is sometimes referred to as a conflict theorist or someone who understands societies as conflicts between groups in that society, in part over the definition of the society, but deeply tied to who has power. So the first thing Marx is gonna say is that you should look at conflict and the second thing that Marx is going to say is that the source of that conflict, or really the source of the, of the ways in which any society is composed, is the economy. So Marx is fundamentally an economic determinist. And what that means is that Marx argues that the way in which a society produces goods defines almost all other aspects of that society. So if you are a hunter-gatherer society, that is a society where people hunt and gather berries and other kinds of things to survive, that is your economy. And that economy is going to determine almost everything else in your society. So hunter-gatherer societies have a political life. And the fact that we are a hunter-gatherer society is going to determine the kind of political life that we have. Hunter-gatherer societies have familial life. So they, they exist in families or community units, or different familial units. The fact that we are hunter-gatherers is going to determine the kinds of families that we have. This economic determinist position means that in order to understand a society, you need to understand how that society produces things, which is to say what the economy of that society is. 
and from an understanding of that, the economy of that society, we can come to more fully capture and grasp all of the other organizational units in a society. So it's not just that we would see this with hunter-gatherer societies, we would see this with feudal societies. Feudal societies will have a very particular kind of organization and those feudal societies and the organization that they have um, are gonna have consequences for religion, for family, for um, the political organization of the society, et cetera, et cetera. So for Marx, he's going to say two things that we need to think about all the time. How is it that things are produced and what are the consequences of that for all the other aspects of society? And how is it that that production, that mode of production has built into it an inherent social conflict between different groups? And how do we analyze that social conflict? In other words, across every mode of economic development and economic um, organization, so whether or not we're a hunter-gatherer society, a feudalist society, or a capitalist society, there's going to be some conflict built in to the ways in which that economy is organized. And so the key to understanding a society is to look at the economic relationships of a society, how things are made and how are they distributed, and to look at the groups that are part of that and how they are in conflict with one another. What this means is that Marx was fundamentally someone interested in what he called social classes um, or economic groups. And in particular, he becomes acutely uh, attentive to classes under the conditions of what he calls capitalism. So capitalism for Marx is a mode of production. It's a way in which things are produced. And capitalism, according to Marx, generates two distinct social classes, two very distinct social classes. There are capitalists and there are workers. Capitalists are people who own things. Workers are people who work, who in Marx's terms will sell their labor power in order to get paid. Here then, return to the insights that we just gleaned from Marx. Marx is going to say that capitalism as a mode of production is going to necessarily determine all kinds of other things. Family life, the political structure, the ways in which religion functions, et cetera, et cetera. So that what we need to study always is the economy, the mode of production, how things are produced and distributed, and then see what the consequent relations will be on the basis of that economic structure. So sometimes when you hear about Marx, people will talk about the mode of production, how it is that things are produced and distributed, and the consequent relations of production. What are the social relationships between groups on the basis of how things are produced? Inherently then within Marx, you will have this uh, idea of social classes. And those classes, as we learned just a moment ago, are going to be in conflict with one another. The inherent quality of those classes is one of conflict, in part because their interests do not align. Capitalists have an interest and workers have an interest and they're going to be different from one another. Now, Marx comes up with a range of arguments for understanding capitalism and how it functions. Um, and you know, capitalists are simply the owners of things. And the job of a capitalist is to tell somebody how to work. They organize uh, workplaces. And the job of a worker is to do that work, to um, sell their labor power, their capacity to work. Marx argues that the capitalist worker relationship is fundamentally grounded in exploitation. And what that means is that capitalists don't actually pay workers for the work that they do. 
they pay workers for a certain amount of work, a time period within which they work. And then the, the task of a capitalist is to find ways to get more work out of people than they paid for. And this is why the capitalist economy, or this is how the capitalist economy is founded in um, uh, an experience of exploitation. Because in order to generate profits, in order to generate sustainable profits, what's required of the capitalist is to pay the workers less than what the workers produce. That is to extract more labor than what they pay for. Now, if any of us have ever worked in a job uh, um, outside of school, and I suspect many of you have, you might have experienced this dynamic a little bit, where your boss tries to get you to do more than you want to do, and you kind of struggle with your boss to do a little bit less. Maybe you take a little bit longer break. Maybe if you're working in a retail store, you know, you and you're asked to fold clothes, you fold them particularly slowly. Maybe you're not as efficient as you overall could be. And the idea here is that there's sort of this like constant struggle or conflict where bosses want you to do more work than what you would like to do, or maybe even than you're capable of. And as a worker, you'd like to do a little bit less. Now, this kind of struggle or interplay happens in lots of contexts. But one of the reasons it becomes particularly exploitative is because of the conditions of power. And in future lectures, we'll talk about power and I'll outline different modes of power or understandings of power. Um, within Marx's conceptualization, capitalists have a lot of power in part because workers, as the division of labor increases, become increasingly interchangeable. What that means is that as capitalists invest more and more in productive processes, one of the things that they may be able to do is quote unquote, de-skill workers. And by de-skilling workers, what it would mean is creating tasks that just about anybody could do. And if you create tasks that just about anybody can do, one of the huge advantages of that is that if any one person quits a job, somebody new can jump in and do that job right away. So certain kinds of jobs, have high skills to them. You can't just replace them with anybody else. So let's take, for example, a surgeon. If a surgeon quits a job, we can't just walk out onto the street and say to the first person we see, hey, you, come here. I need you to come do this surgery. Like, it's kind of impossible, right? I mean, it would be astonishing if it worked, and it almost certainly wouldn't work, and many people would die if that were the case. But there are other kinds of jobs that are lower in skill, um, that maybe don't require as much of training to do them as other kinds of jobs. And so, you know, if your job is to glue two pieces of wood together, there's a certain amount of skill that's required for that. But like, you could kind of take anybody off the street, instruct them on how to do it over the course of two minutes, and they would be not necessarily as good as someone who'd been doing it for a long time, but they'd be decent enough at it. The de-skilling of work processes then means that as um, workers have an increased division of labor where tasks get broken up into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller units, the skills required to do some of those tasks decreases. And as those skills decrease, workers become replaceable with one another. And the replaceability of workers is hugely advantageous to capitalists in part because then workers have less power. They can actually be replaced by other workers with an enormous ease on the part of the capitalists. So here then we have the interest of capital which is to de-skill people and make them work less and less. And we might put this in contrast with the interests of workers. Now, Marx says that part of the interests in workers is an interest in, of course, their material resources, but there's also something that happens with the division of labor 
um, that is against the interests of workers and maybe even against the interest of a society. And this thing is alienation or experiences of alienation. Um, and under capitalism, Marx argues workers suffer from alienation. And he outlines a range um, of alienations. And here today, I'm gonna to talk about four of them. Um, alienation is the idea that as capitalists determine the mode of production, that is how things are produced, the subsequent relations of production, um, um, that is how workers relate to one another and how workers relate to um, capitalists, generally produce some experience of alienation. We can return here for a moment to Adam Smith and to Smith's idea of a division of labor and ask what happens under the conditions of this division of labor? What is the consequence of this rise of the division of labor? And one of the things that we learn, um, and even Smith notes this, is that tasks become super monotonous, right? Like if your task is only to do one tiny part of the productive process, one small, small thing, where you become increasingly kind of removed from the broader production process overall, it can get very repetitive and very boring very quickly. Smith's solution to this problem is education. And he basically says, workers are gonna be hugely, hugely bored, many of them, in their daily work tasks. And the way to deal with this is to give them a kind of life of the mind to produce within them a different sense of themselves. Um, but Marx focuses a lot on how that increase of division of labor creates fundamentally an experience of alienation. And what he means by this is that insofar as workers have little control over their own work, what it is that they do, and very little autonomy overall, they begin to experience some degrees of like removal. And this is psychic to a degree. Um, uh, um, but it's also almost more profound than just a psychic experience of feeling removed. The profound experience is, is existential. And by existential, I mean almost this deep sense for workers of like, who am I and what am I doing? So alienation that, that Marx outlines is that workers are increasingly alienated from the products they produce. By that, I mean, you know, um, I'm wearing a shirt right now. Let's say that, you know, workers are responsible for different parts of this shirt. So one worker may be responsible for the collar of my shirt. What Marx would note is that, like, no worker actually produces the thing, the entire thing that ends up being the shirt. They end up doing little different parts of it. And what this partially results in is like people are alienated from the products that they're producing because they're not really producing products anymore. They're producing constituent or component elements of products. And so the sense of having produced something is actually really difficult if all you're doing is creating a part of a screw that goes into, say, the headphones that are on my head right now. You have nothing to do with the headphones. You're actually alienated from the headphones. And instead, the product itself is something that you're pretty far removed from because your task is super small. You can also be alienated in the second sense from the means of production or how you do something. One of the critical tasks of a capitalist is to organize labor in such a way that they can create surplus value. That is through exploitation. And so insofar as capitalists and workers are in conflict, the capitalist decides how to organize things in ways that they can get more. For the worker then, they become increasingly alienated from the means of production or by, from how things are produced because of the inherent conflict between them and the capitalist. The capitalist who wants things produced in a particular way so that they can get more from the productive process and the workers who maybe want to produce things in different ways so that they could have more of the, of the result of the production process and so that they could maybe feel less alienated. Workers are also alienated from one another. And Marx argues that 
one of the fundamental things that capitalists do is not just create conflict or exist in a system of conflict between capitalists and workers, but also to try and create conflict between workers. So if workers are constantly scared of losing their jobs, if they're constantly scared of the really precarious or fragile conditions that they're living in, they're not going to see their fellow workers necessarily as their friends. They're going to see them as competition, as somebody who could report on them for doing things that are bad, as someone who could potentially take their job. And so the capitalist workplace is incredibly competitive. And in that competitive context, people feel alienated from one another. And that alienation from one another creates deep tensions between workers. Another way that workers are alienated is from species being. This is a strange phrase concept that um, uh, uh, um, Marx uh, presents, but species being is like the idea of humanity. And Marx thinks that as workers go through this experience of capitalists telling them what to do under increasing conditions of the vision of labor, they lose what it is to be human. Um, in a famous film by Charlie Chapman, the, 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 the actor and director and, and uh, movie maker of the early part of the 20th century, there's a scene of, a, of factory workers. And actually this, this particular kind of scene exists a lot in early movies where the factory workers begin to look like elements of the machines they work in themselves. So that like, you know, the gears that have this kind of structure that move or the sort of very formal movements that you see happening within a machine begin to define the workers themselves. Or another way of thinking about it is the distinction between the factory and the worker declines. The workers begin to become part of the machinery of production themselves. In this sense, they lose their humanity. They lose their connection with an idea of themselves as humans. They increasingly become cogs in the machinery of production. They become like the basic tech, they, they become sort of the kind of similar to what you would think of as the, the units that make up a factory are not just the machines and the people, but the line between machines and people begins to blend. And as that happens, people become alienated from species being or their own sense of humanity. And in total, this means that workers become alienated from themselves in a whole host of ways because they are losing a sense of their humanity, they're losing their connection to other workers, they're losing connections to the things that they produce, they're losing connections to the control over how they produce things. And all of this means a basic experience of fundamental alienation. Here then, we begin to see, in addition to a, a, a sociological analysis that looks at the organization of society, the beginnings of some introductions of not just how the economic processes are important for how things are produced, but that they're also important for psychological phenomena. We see the beginnings, a little bit of a social psychology here of alienation. The big take home from Marx is going to be then that we should look at how things are produced in a society and how that production creates inherent groups and that those groups exist in conflict with one another. Again and again and again in this series of lectures, we're gonna build on these fundamental insights and add more and more to them um, um, uh, uh, in order to understand both the Marxian perspective, but then also a, a broader sense of how it is that capitalism or industrial economies work.